Well, good morning to you. Wow, that's big. <laughs> speak, <laughs> speak, Lord. <laughs> Your servant is listening. <laughs> wow. I tell you what, Macca, you've left some anointing residue up here or something. <laughs> so good to have you here. Good morning to you. And uh, wow, what a, uh, what a great morning. Are we ready for the Word of God this morning? Wonderful, wonderful. We just want to just pray for uh, Tracy Watts and her uh, family. Uh, she lost her father this week uh, to cancer. And uh, it was a very sudden uh, diagnosis in January and then passed away just this week. So come on, let's just extend our hand to that family and just pray the comfort of the Lord would be upon them. Father, we lift up the Watts family. And Lord God, we ask that your comfort and your peace would surround them in this hour. And that, Lord God, that you would be an ever-present help in this time of need. Lord, we ask that you would, you would bring comfort to the deep sense of grief and loss. And Lord, that you would just, re, just invoke your arms of love around this whole family right now. We lift up Tracy to you particularly, Lord. And we just ask that you would just cover her today in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Well, we had a, a good week away. So thank you for your prayers. We, uh, whenever we go away, we have great weather. When Gary and Kylie want to go away, this is what they bring. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, sorry, guys. Sorry, guys, you just love spending time with Jesus in the lounge room, so it's so good, it's so good. Thanks, Maddie and Evan, for last week, too. Really powerful. Thank you so much, and uh, really thrilled that God is moving so strongly through you. Thanks for what you're carrying, and uh, these guys are going to be heading back to the States uh, for, for a little season. Uh, they've picked up uh, an opportunity to serve under uh, an evangelist over there called Chris Overstreet, and he runs a ministry that uh, invites uh, trucks to go out right across America and to preach the gospel, win the lost to the Lord. And uh, Evan and Maddie are going to be heading that space of that ministry up and, uh, and be heading back to America. So we've got them for four more weeks. So, uh, yeah, Mama's getting a bit sad, but, uh, but we're going to uh, launch them to, uh, to minister to with us in a few weeks just to... So, sign, seal, and deliver them, and then we're going to just give them a love offering and just bless them big, hey? So that should be fun. Uh, you got to be quiet there with the love offering, so uh, <laughs> it's all good. Hey, Amanda and Bruce Prig are heading to Cambodia in July, and uh, they're looking for two other people to join with them. So if you're interested in going and you've not been to Cambodia particularly, this would be a great trip because it's more of an introductory trip, and uh, it would just be a great thing. So if that interests you, please reach out to us. And we would love to uh, help you get over there. It should be fantastic. Just a quick update on the building facility uh, journey. Uh, so last week, um, the Belmont property closed the door to us. So that, that option is out. So we're down to two. Um, so that's what we were praying, that the Lord would help us decipher the journey ahead by closing doors and keeping one open. Um, we, we've had the building and facilities here appraised this week, and we'll be sending through an offer uh, to the owner this week, so be praying for that, and uh, the DA for the Bennett's Green facility has been verbally approved, uh, so we're just awaiting that in writing, but what we would love for that option to improve further would be there would be a buy option as a security in that space, so if you're still praying, which I believe you will be, and uh, encourage you to do so, uh, they're the two things to be praying. So uh, the, the all offer here is, is seen as favourable, uh, or alternatively, the buy option at Bennett's Green is, is an option that becomes available. So keep praying into that. Uh, we, we, a lot of the, the, the prayer that we're having at the moment senses there's something about to break open for us. So uh, I'll try this side. There's something about to break open for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, too late, too late. Uh, <laughs> So uh, still be praying. Let's, let's believe. And this is our hour. Amen. Amen. Uh, lastly, before we start, um, next Saturday, we're going to be running uh, the very first community consultation for our suicide prevention safe space. And if you've got any level of lived experience of suicide, so what that means is any level of personal experience of suicidality, or you've supported someone in the process of uh, suicide ideation, or you've supported someone that has gone through it, 
and been there as a support, that all is incorporated in a lived experience. And uh, we're just doing a community consultation. We've got some facilita facilitators coming from Sydney to help us. And we're looking for the gaps that are in the community right now. So if you know someone in your world that's journeyed through this, this difficult space, then invite them along. And it would be great to hear their experience of how we can bring a safe space to this city. It'll be the first non-clinical safe space in Lake Macquarie. And uh, we're privileged to be given the opportunity to do that. What an incredible opportunity to help save lives and also support people going through some of the hardest grieving that you can experience through suicide. So on a brighter note, let's uh, get into the Word of God. <laughs> so it should be good. We're going to launch a new series that will take us through the next series of weeks. Um, and it was really uh, instigated from a message that David Crabtree brought some weeks ago where he, he brought an incredible message, but there was one part of it that stuck out to us and to our team that we just thought we need to mine down deeper into that and take the church on a journey. And in fact, Holy Spirit stirred us in that space and said, I want you to mature gateway further into this space. And so he said something along the lines of this. He said, um, he said, joy is what the brain feeds on, and the right side of the brain, which is the area that we pray for at Healing Path to Wellness so often, the limbic area of the brain, or the emotional brain, is the joy center. So this is it's up on the screen, this next slide. He said, as a disciple of Jesus, maturity can be measured by the speed of returning to joy after you've been emotionally dysregulated. <laughs> I don't know about you, but that, that challenges me. <laughs> Maturity is measured by how fast, when you get emotionally triggered, that you return to joy. Now, maybe you've had a week whereby someone has treated you unjustly or upset you, and you've had an emotional reaction to it. Maybe it was at work. Maybe it was your boss. Maybe it was a work colleague. Maybe it was a family member. Maybe it was a text message that came to you. Maybe it was something that was said that made you feel incredibly unseen and unwanted. <laughs> and I'm not talking about those words that are spoken that, you know, they sting a bit, but, you know, you just flick them off, they're fine. I'm talking about the ones that invoke... Ugh, angry, frustrated, words come out of your lips that don't normally do so. Do you know those types of experiences? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Two of you were honest. <laughs> Maybe you had one this morning on the way here. See, one of the, one of the pursuits we're going after this year at Gateway is that we're, we're, we're desiring to highlight discipleship, being with Jesus, being like Jesus, doing what he did. And when I look at the story of Jesus, I don't see a guy that reacted like perhaps we can. I see a guy that had the ability to experience some of the most torment that anyone could dare to dream but he handled it in a way where he remained in peace and in joy. And I feel like the Lord is taking us on this journey where he wants to actually improve and mature us. You know, maybe you were triggered this week where you felt rejected and it, it, it triggered you back to those times in your younger days where that situation took place that reinforced that value. Or maybe you were criticized this week for something that you actually put a lot of effort and time into, and that negative voice started speaking to you again that started telling you you'll never amount to anything. And these are the things that can take us out in our journey. The devil cannot steal your salvation, but he can certainly dampen your joy. The devil cannot steal your, 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 your salvation and going to heaven and enjoying the presence of God, but he can certainly dial down the amount of joy that you carry and make you live a life that feels like you're struggling instead of thriving. And I believe that the Holy Spirit is stirring us in this area right now. 
And look, I, I've got to be honest. I find when bad things happen, I'm pretty good for a series of moments where it's bad and it's bad and it's bad. But there comes a point where my emotional capacity hits a ceiling. And if I get triggered one more time, it's almost like... And all of us have varying levels of capacity and resilience is the, the fancy word that we use now. But the truth is we're all conditioned by the world to focus not on the solution, but to focus on our vulnerabilities, to focus on the liabilities, to focus on who said what and what they said they were they're going to do and they didn't. And, and we focus on all this stuff that sends us into a place where we lose our joy. And I just want to remind you that as a follower of Jesus, it's actually not normal for you to stay cynical as the world is modeling. It's actually not normal for you to stay worried and keep meditating night after night after night after night about that problem. It's not normal for you to do that. It's actually not normal for you to live constantly with a pessimistic attitude. Now, I know some of you might have grown up in a house where pessimism was the normal natural language. That might have been your experience, but let me tell you, that is, that is not the destiny in Jesus. So I just want to categorically get us to declare something to start with. That negative is not our normal. So let's say it after me. Negative is not our normal. Say it just one more time. Negative is not our normal. So if that's true, how do we actually live opposite that? How do we actually live where the, the, the state of joy is actually our rule of life? And what I mean by a rule of life is a pattern of life that we just choose to live from. And it's developed in us. There's something where we say, you know what, I'm just not going to get involved in that rubbish that, that social media just invokes in me. Like when I read some posts from people that I know in the city, and the, 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 the stuff that they write is so... <laughs> and everything in me just wants to go, blast the, you know... And part of me goes, I would be justified to do it. I get triggered by that stuff. And then wisdom says, Craig, leave it alone. And I just turn my phone off and go, stop looking at that stuff. Don't let that stuff disciple or determine the joy in my life today. Now, I know there's a lot of negative in the world. There's a whole lot of stuff that potentially is happening in your day right now. When you leave here, there is things that are still yet to be addressed that need to be sorted. And it's not like I'm here professing that if you're a follower of Jesus, everything is awesome. <laughs> everything is fun. Everything is delightful. You're one of those people that when you wake up in the morning and you see the sun shining, you're just, oh, wasn't it a wonderful day? <laughs> and if you wake up like today where it's pouring rain, you go, oh, thank you, Jesus, for the rain. I don't know who you are. I'm not like that. <laughs> but God bless you if you are. <laughs> but how do we... Remain in joy, and importantly, really the heart of this series is how do we do develop greater measures of joy? And so I'm not going to present over the next five weeks how to discover joy. Because in essence, if, if I'm inviting you to discover something, it infers this, you don't have it. If, if I'm trying to teach you how to discover joy in the midst of your most difficult circumstance, then what I'm actually, what I'm actually proposing to you is you, you're trying really hard, but you're not there yet. And if you can just do three, four, five more principles in your life, you might just make it. Well, I want to smash that concept that you haven't arrived, and I want to smash it because in Christ you have the fullness of joy. In fact, 
the scripture says that here in Psalm 16, it says, You have made known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. See, I want to make the distinction because when you're struggling in your career, the default is this. If I can just get a better job, I'll be more joyful. Or if we're struggling in our relationships, if I could just find another relationship, maybe I'll be happier. And if I'm trying to discover joy, it makes me think that maybe it's found in the place where I'm not right now. But I want to propose to you, perhaps we've got it all around the wrong way. What if we recognize we're developing joy and that wherever we are, joy is there. We've just got to, disco- we've got to discover how we can develop it further. See, joy is not something you're looking for. It's been given to you by grace. And I know that many of us are going through really difficult situations right now. And I'm not suggesting that it's always easy and fun. But I am suggesting that we can develop something through it. So, let's define what joy is and what it isn't. Firstly, I want us to be clear, you can't associate joy with your status or your success. When I was 21, I drove my very first car, which was a three-cylinder Daihatsu Charade. I know. It says a lot about who I am. (laughs) It was actually a really good car. It really was a good car, except when I drove to Sydney, going up to Mooney Mooney, and I struggled to overtake the truck that was in the left slow lane. And here I am in the middle lane, trying my best to overtake a truck, holding up the traffic behind me, and I thought this, I will find joy if I have a car one day that accelerates up this hill. Well, good news, I got one. I upgraded to a Honda Civic. Come on. (laughs) And when I'm driving a Honda Civic up the hill, I'm wondering, how much more could I accelerate up this hill if I had another car? Do you see how status and success, you define it by certain levels. If I could just reach that height, then I'll be happy. But the truth is, you get there and you realize that there's always something better. We have seen right throughout the media those that have the most, you know, worldly success and worldly status are not the happiest people in the world. And so I want to just smash that concept straight away. Joy, dare I say it, is not just an emotion measuring your happiness. Now, the Bible describes joy with the Greek word, Beth, kara, or you say it, hara. C-H-A-R-A. And it's, it's, a, it's a word that derives from haris, from grace. So the biblical concept of joy is, is includes your happiness, but it's not directly associated just with your happiness. It's actually associated with a gift that God has given us. It's according to His grace. Joy is an expression of His grace. You can't earn it. You don't always deserve it. You don't always, you know, find yourself doing the things that bring joy. But the truth is you can always access it because it's a grace direct from the Lord. And the wonderful thing about biblical joy is that you can develop it and enjoy it even in the midst of the worst situation you're in. See, the world would say... You are joyful when your circumstances are all going well for you. And we are living in a world right now that is consumed with happiness. I mean, people will finish a job to go to another job just to feel happy because they think an extra bit of money might actually be a step up. Now, it might be. The Lord could bless us with more jobs that give us a new job that gives us a a financial blessing. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you think that the problems that you had in that last job won't be carried through to the next job, because here's the deal, you're there. It might not necessarily be your boss, 
It might be you. But we search from thing to thing to thing, relationship to relationship to relationship, searching for happiness. And we don't find it. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. There is the secret to developing joy. Find the places where you experience the presence of God. Romans 14, 17 says this, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating or drinking, but it is of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. If you want to know where the kingdom of God is, look for where righteousness is reigning. If you want to know where the, peace, the kingdom of God is, it's where the peace of God is reigning and ruling. And guess what? Joy is a third of that process. If you're not experiencing joy, you're living with a two-thirds experience. Joy is actually the natural manifestation where the kingdom of God is, 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 is being demonstrated. And I think the church, generically, not this one, a couple of ones down the corner, we need an injection of fresh joy. We need to get a little happier. Not because we're feeling good, but because we are in the presence of God. And where the presence of the Lord is, not only is there liberty, but there is a fullness of joy. So I want to propose to you that you can constantly, constantly develop more joy as you become aware of the joy that dwells within the Trinity. And whilst the circumstances of life can influence your mood, you're actually invited to live above your feelings, whether they're positive or negative. I, I, I had a great birthday on Monday. I had a, a magnificent steak. It was... It was the best steak I had this week. And, uh, and you know, I was so happy. Like, I ate it and I was just, oh, like, it was, good. it was so good. I'm sorry if you're vegetarian, but it was so good. It was plant-based. It, it ate lots of plants before it got to me. <laughs> on Tuesday, on Tuesday, I had a chicken Caesar salad. And it was also nice. But it wasn't as nice as the steak the night before. And if I, if I measured my happiness on the food that I ate, I would be much happier on a Monday than I was on a Tuesday. <laughs> but that's just crazy that we measure our happiness on our external circumstances. But the truth, and I'm, I'm making light of this, but the truth is we do it. Yeah. We wake up and we go, oh man, I'm just sick of not being happy. And I get it. Life's tough. It's got some challenges. But is it that we're basing our happiness on an external circumstance rather than the very inward sense of God in us? I look at, I look at our city. Four years we've been, over nearly five years we've been doing Healing Path to Wellness. And I'm, I'm amazed at the level of anxiety and depression that continue to, to, to disrupt the peace of our city. And we live in Australia. Like we're not living in the poverty of some areas of the world. We're living in an absolutely glorious place. Not perfect, but it is amazing. And yet our mental health as a nation continues to be, continues to regress. Our, our, area, our, area, area, our area health district, Hunter New England Area Health, together with the Central Coast area, together in 2022 reported the highest number of deaths by suicide in all of Australia. Our area, this geography, there's something not working with the pursuit of happiness. And I think today we're going to look at how we do it. So if joy is not just an emotion, if it's not just defined by the measure of pleasure, then what is it? John Mark Homer says this, and he says, true joy is not just an emotion but it's rather the condition of your heart. And really, my prayer over this series is that you would capture postures, which are attitudes, and practices, which are actions that you do, that would help you develop joy where you can find yourself in the most pleasurable experiences and celebrate, absolutely, but you can also find yourself in the most difficult places of your story right now and you're still able to develop and carry joy. 
So how are we going to do this? That's a good question. So turn with me to James chapter 1. And it's a love-hate relationship, this passage. (laughs) And you know where I'm going. James chapter 1, verse 2 says, Consider it pure joy. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. So James here is saying, even in the midst of your most challenging circumstances, you can count it all joy. You can consider it all joy. So it is possible for you to develop joy even in the trials. So how do we do it? Well, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, there's a word you don't hear on social media a whole lot, (laughs) let perseverance finish its work so that you might be mature and complete, not lacking anything. I think one of the the best things that this passage helps me with is to know that there are different types of trials that I face. And I think to develop joy, the first thing that we can posture and practice in our life is to actually recognize how do I manage the, the trial that I'm actually facing. Like, if you're facing temptation... That's, un- in, the, in the scripture here, that's part of the, the context here. If you're, if you're facing a trial of temptation, the way you react to that is different from if you're experiencing chronic suffering or chronic, you know, difficulty in this space over here. See, the Bible teaches that if you're experiencing the trial of temptation, James would say, resist the devil and he will flee. But if you're experiencing incredible hardship, it's not about resisting the devil, although he might be part of that story. The truth is, consider it all joy means that there's a sense of acceptance, of surrender to this moment, knowing that if I journey through this, I'm going to become more perseverant. And as I become more perseverant, I'm actually going to be maturing where I will actually be completed in my journey of looking more like Jesus. The problem is, if you're over here, it's easy to say, well, this is just who I am. It's just a chink in my armor that can never be overcome. And instead of resisting the devil, you accept it. Whereas over here, instead of embracing the challenge and saying, Lord, I know you are maturing me through it, you resist it and you walk away. So people are are accepting what they're meant to resist and resisting what they're meant to accept. So it's important that you know what trial you're facing. Now, some trials are the result of temptation, some trials are the result of spiritual warfare, and some trials are the results of our bad decisions. But we can consider it all joy if we know how to navigate the trial and come through it knowing that all things work together for good for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Now, Romans 5 says a similar thing. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character and character hope. Now, we all want the marks of perseverance and character and hope dwelling in our, in our countenance, don't we? We all want it. And sometimes opportunities do arrive where we change from here to here because there's a destiny shift. But, you know, I'm convinced that the church can be influenced by the, the influence of the world by changing from this to this to this to this to this to this to this because we're looking for our happiness in the circumstance. If you're under 25 here this morning, I want to just encourage you. You won't hear this too much out there, but I want to encourage you. Longevity is a gift. And when you're married, to be married for 30, 40, 50, 60 years is an absolute gift. To be in a, to be in a, a, a ministry space where you are gathering together with like-minded people and you journey together on a long journey and you actually do life together. You're not here, there, doing this, doing that. And then next week, there's a longevity about it. There is wisdom in that. And I would say to you, if you're under 25, pursue something 
that you can sink your teeth in and say, I'm in this for the long haul. These are my tribe. These are my people. And I'm going to do life with them all the way through. And I tell you, there is a maturity and a growth that will come on you that if you change from this to this to this, this, you won't get it. You will miss out on the fullness of that maturity that's available to you. The model of Jesus is extraordinary. And Hebrews 12.2 gives us one of the greatest models of how to, how to develop joy in our life through the tough stuff. Hebrews 12.1, since we're surrounded by a cloud of great witnesses, let's throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Listen, can I just say real quick, if you're struggling, in, in, as Beth mentioned in, in the communion message, if you, this sin that just keeps entangling you, it's going gonna, it's gonna to disrupt your joy. You've got to deal with it. You can't just keep pushing it away and going, I know I'm covered by the blood of Christ. And of course we are. But if you think that Jesus wants us just to be using grace to cover us rather than clothe us in righteousness, we're, we're living in an inferior life. So just deal with it. And honestly, joy will rise. Let us run the, the, the race with perseverance. I've said perseverance more times today than I think I've ever done in one message. Maybe the Lord's speaking to us about this. Verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, not fixing our eyes on the happiness of the circumstance, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. Here it is. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. This is, I think, one of the best descriptions in the Scriptures of how to stay developing joy through the tough stuff. Now, let me just say this. Jesus wasn't excited to go to the cross because he knew what was coming. He knew that the, the scourging before he even got to walk up the hill to Golgotha was almost going to kill him. He knew the weight of the cross would be so heavy. He knew that as the nails were driven through his flesh, and the pain of hanging from a cross for six hours and actually hung there, suffocating more and more in that journey. There's no joy in that. It's not like the Christian message is, if you're suffering right now, you've got to just choose joy. It's hard. Embrace the hardship. Validate the hardship. This is not fun. But for the joy set before him, he actually set joy as a focus before it became a feeling. He saw joy as a focus before it became a feeling. Now, we know the end of the story. He rises again and has an extraordinary breakthrough where the joy of the Lord hits not just his disciples, but the whole city and beyond, and we're living in the fullness of that now. But he was able to go through his hardship because he could see what was before him. And I want to prophesy over your gateway that I know that some of the stuff that you're walking through right now is extraordinarily tough. But there is a joy on the other side that if you could just set your hearts for a focus on that, I tell you, you'd be able to walk through what you're going through and stay in an imposture of peace. So I want to say to you, joy is not just an emotion. It can include that. Happiness is a feeling and it's a good feeling. I'm not saying we don't want to be happy people. But if we're just driving our, our fulfillment in life on a feeling, then we're actually not positioning ourselves to know how to get through the tough stuff in life. Joy is first and foremost a point of view. Jesus saw the joy set before him and he endured the cross and got through it because he knew there was a glorious day on the other side of it. And I believe that the Lord is stirring each of us this morning to say, don't delight in the pain you're going through. Delight in the purpose that the pain is created to actually do something in you that you can only grow through this difficult circumstance that you're walking through. I don't understand the story of transformation. If it was me, I'd say, make your life sweet all the journey of life and then get to heaven and just keep it sweet. But the truth is, Jesus knows better. And he says, that hard stuff you're going through, you're going to get better because of it. And if you can walk through it, you're going to become a stronger believer in Jesus. Let's finish with this. 
Philippians chapter 4, and then we're going to get the team back up to do this. Philippians 4 verse 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. The word there, rejoice, is another derivation of the word for joy, which is a derivation of the word for grace. It basically is the verb form of the noun joy. So if you want to do joy, the word there is rejoice. Now, when we're, we have one of the gifts of all religions in that one of our expressions of Christianity is worship. And week in and week out, on a Sunday, and we get the chance to do it wherever we are, we actually get the chance to sing. And something, something goes off in us when we sing. When you put Spotify on, and there's that great new song, and you just sing along to it, endorphins go through your body, and you instantly start to feel happy. There is something physiologically that takes place when you act out joy. When you act out your posture of joy. And that's why the worship leaders do such a great job. They're like, come on, guys, you're doing so good, but come on, keep going. Because what they're doing is they know if you can move from that posture of, oh, I'm tired, I've had a big week, oh, praise the Lord. And they can get you to unfold your arms and start thinking, hmm, the Christian two-tap. And then all of a sudden, you start seeing the words, you're going, yeah, that's right. My God is able. Yeah, that's right. I can see. I can start to see, and I'm, yeah, Pastor Ken does. <laughs> the water pump. <laughs> oh, dear. Where am I going? I have no idea. Rejoice in the Lord always. It is a verb of the very state that we find ourselves in in Christ. And when you don't feel it, do it anyway. David says in Psalm 103, uh, what does he say? <laughs> he says, soul, I command you to praise the Lord. Paraphrase. In other words, my soul doesn't feel like it, but you're going to rejoice because you're a person of joy. And that is your normal posture. And so we're going to do that this morning. We're going to actually celebrate the Lord. In the presence of God is the fullness of joy. Now, I know you might not feel extremely happy right now. But the truth is, to develop joy is a privilege. It's a privilege. And I think it would be a good thing for us to learn how to celebrate Eat good food, gather with people we love, do things that we enjoy, stay in joy, enjoy. And so we're going to do that this morning. I've asked the team just to re-sing that, that song that we launched this morning because the truth is you can focus on all the, the tough stuff. But this scripture goes on to say, whatever it is, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is praiseworthy or excellent, think about such things. I know so many of you are so good at meditating because you tell me that you've been worried night after night after night after night. You're meditating. You've got the skill. Just refocus it now on things that are good, things that are pleasing, things that are worthy, things that are not notable, things that will bring you joy. So come on, let's stand this morning. I think we need to get out of our rows this morning. If you want to come down the front, you're welcome to do that. At least step out of your row. And I just feel like there's an impartation of joy. I'm going to pray over us that we would become a people of maturity in the area of joy. Do you think we could do that? So come on, lift your hands. <laughs> you know why I do that? It gets us out of that posture of normal. Come on, lift our hands. Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to be a people like Jesus. We want to be people that, Lord, even in the midst of the scourging and the toughest stuff, that, Lord, we would be able to carry joy because we can see it before us. Lord, develop a greater measure of, our, of joy. 
the joy of the Lord in our lives. Father, help us in our worst situations right now to see you in it and to find ourselves, Lord, content in the goodness of God. Father, we pray for breakthrough over the things that we need breakthrough on. But Father, I pray we would be joyful through it, that we might be mature and we would be lacking in nothing. So Spirit of God, release a fresh impartation upon us now. Lord, we ask for a fresh dose of joy to fall on this house and that Lord, we would be the most joy-filled people in all the city. In the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. Come on, let's sing it together. I got joy. Hallelujah. I got joy, joy, joy. Down in my heart, I got joy, joy, joy. Down in my heart, I got joy, joy, joy. Down in my heart, hallelujah. There's still space at the front. I got joy, joy, joy. Down in going to just release a, a vision he had in the prayer meeting this morning and after he releases it there's going to be a grace exchange that takes place and then the team are going to sing one more time and I'm believing for an impartation and a deliverance to take place in that place you ready come on lift your hands listen to what Gary saw and then we're going to sing and we're going to believe God for that move okay Holy Spirit showed me a picture of five letterboxes lined up. The keys were locked. And what I went on to see was the keys turn. So if you understand five, the number of grace. And the keys started to turn and, and the letterbox was open. And what I seen was a new letter put in upon the old stuff. And that five, I believe there's a letter of grace, a new letter of grace being placed on your story. Amen. So I release that over you now. I ask, hands in the air, receive. Take it. Take it, take it, take it. Father, I release the new letter, the new story of grace that you have prepared for your people, these people, our people, gateway people. So I want 
Tube Church, a big yes. Yes, I receive. And I want you to picture yourself pulling that letter out of the letterbox. It's yours. It's 11-11, and the spirit of joy has just touched your soul. I tell you, you're in a spirit of transition right now out of somberness into delight, into pain, from pain into glory. I tell you, the spirit of the Lord is coming upon you. And so, Father, we bless this congregation. We bless this house. Lord, we thank you for those grace exchanges, and we bless it in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said... Amen and amen. If you need prayer this morning, you're welcome to come out and receive it. Have an awesome week, and we'll see you next week on Mother's Day. God bless you.